In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to him and to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with the repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the, his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you care what other people think about you, how they feel about you? Sometimes, I think if we're maybe being a little dismissive or coy, we, we hear that question and we can say, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't really care. I'm my own person. I'm secure in who I am. I don't care what other people think about me. But then at other times, that really comes out that we do care. A, a few years ago, Back in 2018, I went to my 20th high school reunion. So do what you want with those dates, right? Uh, for some of you, you're going to be like, 20, he's been out, wait, over 20 years, he's old. And others are going to say, young guy, right? So whatever, you do what you want with that. But going to my high school reunion, I'm from Northeast Ohio, so I had flown back that summer, I believe it was in July 2018, that I flew back to Ohio, and we went to downtown Cleveland to an area called, or known as the Flats, and we got together for our, our high school reunion. And going in, at the time I was 38 years old, Married happily, three kids that were beautiful and growing and healthy, have a job and, and have life in Colorado half a country away, and didn't think much, you know, I don't really care what these people think about me. I'm just going to go and have a good time and see if I find any friends from high school. But then I got there, and if I'm honest, uh, quickly I started to, to realize 
that I was back in school, right? In my head, in my heart, in my feelings, I was back in school, and I quickly cared what everyone thought about me, right? And I knew, I remembered from 20 years previous, you've got the cool kids, you've got the jocks, right? You've got the, the kids who are in band and the kids who are uh, maybe known for some uh, unhealthy recreational activities, right? And, and I saw all these people and I started feeling a little self-conscious and and look okay and and uh, suck in my gut a little bit for the pictures and all all that stuff and, and I realized boy as as much as I'd like to think I don't care what other people think I, I do care it is important and it, it's important for for us as human beings to to be know, known by others and to know that others care about us and like us for who we are. And so maybe, maybe you've had experiences in life where you can relate, where you realize, oh, I care more about what my spouse's employees think about me than maybe I, I should. I, I care more about what the other people at church on Sunday morning think about me, think about how I conduct my family. Think about how I dress. Think about how I talk. And it's okay to care about being cared for, about being loved, about being accepted, because, well, that's what God has created us for. He's built in us that desire to be loved. So today, we're going to talk about the baptism of our Lord Jesus. And we're going to see in that baptism of our Lord the care of our God for his Son and for others. John the Baptist was a relative of Jesus. Sometimes it gets said he was a cousin of Jesus. We don't know if it's a first cousin, second cousin, third cousin. We don't know the details there, but he certainly is related to Jesus. And John the Baptist, or I prefer to say it this way, John the Baptizer, right? Because we know John wasn't Baptist. He was Lutheran, <laughs> right? <clears throat> and so here, John the Baptizer is is out in the sort of in the wilderness area in the Jordan region away from the main cities away from Jerusalem away from Bethlehem away from Nazareth away from Galilee down in the Jordan Valley and John the Baptist he was a preacher and and a bit eccentric right uh, I mean I don't think anyone then or now would look at him and say, oh, John, he was just an, an ordinary guy. No, he, he kind of had an odd diet. He ate bugs. Okay, so, yeah, that's a little weird. He also uh, wasn't keeping up with the latest fashion trends, apparently. He wore camel's hair. And he wasn't tickling anyone's ears with his sermons. So, uh, on the one hand, John the Baptizer was extremely popular to the point where people are coming out of the cities, they're coming out of the towns, they're coming down the Jordan Valley to the river, and they're listening to John the Baptist preach, and he was preaching it, right? But he was not tickling ears. He was not saying what people just wanted to hear and making them feel good about themselves. no. His message was a message that was pointed, was direct. His message was a message of repentance, right? And so that, that word repentance, it's a big biblical word, right? But repentance, essentially, and, and John kind of meaning it in the, the fullness of that word repentance, it means stop doing what you're doing and start doing the things of God, Get right. Stop sinning. And people 
We're coming to hear him speak about this. And, and why? Because what John was also preaching was the kingdom of heaven. What he said was that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right here. And so in, in the first century Jewish context, the people of his day, they hear, all right, this guy, he's a little odd, but he kind of looks like hmm, the prophet Elijah from the Old Testament. He's dressing like him. The Old Testament tells us that Elijah is going to show up again. This guy, he's weird. He's showing up. He's preaching. He's telling us to repent. I know my life isn't perfect. Maybe I should listen to this guy. And so people go out to him, and by the droves, they are repenting and receiving his, his baptism. To the point when even the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, insert pastors, if you will, they come, and they're kind of standing by, listening. What's this guy doing and he says, <laughs> who warned you, brood of vipers, to flee from the wrath of, to come? <laughs> uh, don't think that just because you have Abraham as your father, that that makes you special. You think you're special? You're not. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Live lives that look like followers of God. So the, here John is preaching this, this very pointed, direct message to the people of Israel, and people are coming out and, and listening to him, and then here comes Jesus. Now John had spoken about Jesus a little bit in his preaching. He says, After me comes one who is mightier than I, who is Sandals I'm not even, even worthy to take off his feet. I mean, the lowest of low things you could do in that world is clean someone's dirty, nasty, yucky feet with their calluses and the manure and all this stuff that they had stepped in, right? And he says this, I'm not even worthy to do that. Not to this guy. When he comes, <laughs> he's not just going to baptize with water. He's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit i.e. salvation, and with fire, i.e. judgment. So here, John has this very high, exalted view of Jesus. Specifically, he's thinking about Jesus, about the Christ, about the King of Kings coming on that last day to judge the living and the dead. And so when you... Understand, John has this image of Jesus in his mind. When, when Jesus comes to him and says, please baptize me, you can understand why John was a bit incredulous. Whoa, no way. You, Jesus, should be baptizing me. You want me to baptize you? And it's at that point that Jesus says, let this happen so that you and I fulfill all righteousness. Now this is was interesting to me. What's, what's Jesus saying here when he says fulfill all righteousness? Let's look in the Old Testament a little bit. And, and this is where I can say, too, as your pastor, this is where I learned something new to this week. I'm always learning as I'm studying for sermons and preparing to preach. I get to, to look at scriptures and learn things, too. This was a cool insight for me. Uh, Psalm 71, verse 15, says this, My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation, all the day, for their number is past my knowledge. So do you see what's happening there? 
I, in my mind, I used to, to just merely think, solely think of righteousness as kind of like the holiness, the goodness, how God is, is better than us, how he's perfect, right? But in the Old Testament, regularly, the righteous acts of God are seen closely related to his salvific acts, his saving grace, his, his works of righteousness. And another, uh, another one, let's take a look at Isaiah 51, 8. My righteousness, this is God speaking, my righteousness will be forever in my salvation to all generations. So when Jesus says to John, let us do this now to fulfill all righteousness, Jesus is thinking, and John would be thinking with him, and this would be why John relented and, and said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go with this. They're thinking about the righteous acts of God to save people from their sins, to save the people of Israel. The righteous acts of God, like delivering them from Pharaoh's hands in, in Egypt, like spreading the waters and separating them so that the people of Israel could walk across on dry ground, like providing for them, caring for them in the wilderness for those 40 years that they meandered there like bringing them home to the promised land, to Israel, where they could find their habitation. These are the righteous acts of God. And so when Jesus says to John, let us do this now. I know maybe this doesn't make sense. Let us do this now so that we can fulfill all righteousness. I think what's, what's happening here is the incarnation of our God. God being with us is going one step further. Here's what I mean. On Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, right? We say this, that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, that Jesus humbled himself to be born as a baby, to be born as Azalea so nicely pointed out for us earlier, in a manger, or to be laid in a manger, right? to be born by humble parents, Mary and his adoptive father, Joseph. At that moment, Jesus perfectly became 100% God and simultaneously 100% man incarnate, right? Uh, you, know, you can hear in there kind of carne, think of chili, con carne, right? With meat, right, is what that means. Um, Jesus came in meat, right, in the flesh to be with us, just like, like us. Except there's one thing that w Jesus was different than us at that point, because he was perfect. We as we've all been victims of the fall and of our own sinful, selfish activities, we are sinners. Jesus was still a perfect human being. And yet when Jesus steps into the waters of the Jordan River, what's he doing? He's stepping into the sin-polluted waters of those who have gone before him and repented of their sins. All those sins of the people of Israel that had been washed off in the waters of the Jordan, now Jesus is stepping in and he says, pour those on me so I can be perfectly like them, so that I can identify with people perfectly to fulfill all righteousness. So when Jesus takes upon the sins of the world in his baptism, we see the, the Holy Spirit coming down like a dove, hovering like the Spirit did over the waters in creation, Genesis 1-2. 
we see John pouring water on Jesus. Oh, wait, <clears throat> excuse me. We see John dunking Jesus in the water. Oh, wait. We see John sprinkling the water on Jesus. Scripture doesn't tell us that. Maybe we should just kind of let that one go, right? Just saying. And we hear the Father's voice. And what does the Father say? This is my beloved Son. With him I'm well pleased. I love him. That's what the Father says. This is my boy. I love him. This is good. And in that moment, Jesus perfectly identifies with us. It's so, so crucial to identify with others if we're going to show them that we actually care, that we love them. And I think one of the ways that Maybe we can see this happening, and this is kind of a crude illustration, so take it for what it's worth, but is in an adult's relationship with children. When adults want to show children that they care about them, what do they say? I'd say they, they speak in, they say things like, I love you, right? They also speak in maybe baby talk, depending on how old the kid is, right? Uh, they might slow down their speech. So not just the, the words that they say, but how they say them. Mr. Rogers was great to me and my generation in this, where he would look to us on the, through the screen, right, and he would speak slowly and to us at a level that we understood Tell us about how we're special, how we're loved. Right? I know sometimes uh, when adults are talking to children, get down on their level. Look them in the eye. And, and by your words, by your tone of voice, by, by your actions as an adult, you can communicate to children, I love you. I, I care about you. You're important to me. When Jesus stepped into the waters of the Jordan, he was perfectly identifying with us and telling us, I love you, I care about you. You're important to me. A few years later, Jesus shows us his love perfectly. And this is recorded in, in the New Testament all over the place, but one example I want to bring out is, is from Ephesians chapter 5. It says, husbands, any husbands here? I'm talking to you, right? Listen to this. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. Okay? So husbands, just know here's your standards, right? Love your wives, but, but, but what does that mean? How did Christ love the church? Did Christ love the church by picking some nice flowers for us and saying, ooh, you're special to me. Here's your bouquet. I remembered. I remembered our anniversary. I remembered Valentine's Day. Of course not. Jesus shows us that he loves us through his actions on the cross. To finish that verse, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus loved the church, his people, so much he was willing to die. So husbands, here's your standard. I don't know if you're anything like me, but uh, let's keep working on this one, right? <laughs> so that we can reflect the love of Jesus. As Jesus hung upon the cross, his arms opened. They weren't opened because the nails held him to the cross. They're opened because he loves you, cares about you, thinks you're important, and wants to save you from the effects of sin so that Jesus, as our perfect substitution, 
He takes those sins upon himself and then he, he does that in the waters of baptism and then he goes to the cross and he dies the death that we deserve so that he could give us the life, the abundant life that he has to give. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us through his <laughs> actions, through his words. He's gentle. Take my yoke upon you. It's easy. He doesn't put out a smoldering wick. He tells us over and over and over again, I love you. And when we go to be baptized, God tells us this again. In Matthew 28, end of the book that we're in, right? Jesus says this, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, followers, disciples, fancy word for followers of Jesus, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So, God the Father tells the Son, Jesus, in baptism, I love you. Jesus tells us on the cross, I love you. In baptism, the, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, tells us, I love you. Again. Over and over and over. And so here, now our baptism connects us to the cross and connects us to Jesus so that what what said in Romans chapter 6 is absolutely true. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were made part of what he has done, not just his death. Of course, this verse goes on and talks about his resurrection as well. Baptism is a way, is a means of grace, as we, we refer to it, and is, is a place where God says, I love you. But telling someone that I love you can be a little bit risky, right? Think about uh, times where people say, I love you, maybe for the first time to one another. What's the anticipated response? I love you too. Now, all right, now before we get there though, I love you. Mm hmm. <laughs> I love you. Okay. <laughs> I love you. Thanks. Or we've maybe seen those uh, videos uh, at a sports arena, at a basketball game, where during halftime, fiance takes his, his, uh, his uh, or, or I'm sorry, a man takes his hope for fiance out to the center of the court. He says, I love you. And he gets down on one knee, will you marry me? And, and then his bride to be won't be, and she runs off, right? <laughs> <laughs> It's brutal, right? Of course, there are times in life where people say, I love you, and, and it's not, maybe it's not, not the time. Not yet, or maybe <laughs> that love you know is, is something's messed up with it, and that's not the type of love that Jesus gives, right? But generally speaking, when someone says, I love you, our response is, all together now, I love you too. And we say this in our prayers. How we sometimes talk about our prayer life and we use the acronym ACTS. And what's the A and ACTS stand for? Adoration. Right? Or, to be even more liturgical, if you will, uh, in the Lord's Prayer, which we all just said together, how do we start by saying, or what do we start off by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, that's very fancy, King James, liturgical language. But maybe what we're just saying is, Father in heaven, you're the best dad ever. You're so good to us. I love you too. 
You're holy. You're perfect. I love you too. In a few weeks, less than two weeks actually, I'll be going with a few of our confirmation age children on our confirmation retreat. And so Joy, my daughter, and Isaac, my son, will be there. Flynn Jolly will be there. And uh, Ada Weiss will be there. There will also be uh, three children from uh, Gracious Savior in Edwards. And we're heading to Edwards. We're staying in a home there. And at this confirmation retreat, our topic of study is prayer. And we'll talk all about prayer. And we'll talk about the meanings of the fancy words and the high fluent language in the Lord's Prayer. But the goal isn't for people to walk away from that confirmation retreat to know about prayer. The goal, the hope, is that people walk away from that retreat knowing how to pray and praying. And one of those things that people, we hope, will be praying is, I love you too. I love you too, Father. I love you too, Jesus. I love you too, Spirit. Will you pray for us as we, we head out in a few days on this confirmation retreat? Pray that the, the Holy Spirit takes hold of our hearts, that he hovers <laughs> over our hearts and our lives like he did over the waters at creation, like he did over Jesus at his baptism, and draws us into a perfect love with God in heaven. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord God, Heavenly Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have shown us your perfect, merciful, gracious love. Work in our hearts through your word and your sacraments to hear your words of love to us and to respond by saying to you, I love you too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.